Um, if anybody happened to have videoed uh, the thing we did last night on Mount Precipice, I'd like to talk with you later. If so, I, I think it uh, somebody may have. Um, you guys know that right now we're floating where Jesus walked, uh, only because we don't walk so well on surfaces like this. But I'd like to orient you to something, uh, kind of what you're looking at. We're in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. How about that? First thing in the morning, we get church in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. I mean, go home and tell your friends that, right? Okay, we came from over here. That's Engev over there. This whole side of the lake over here is the land of the Gadarenes. And we'll be talking about that a little bit later. Pastor Rich is going to be talking about uh, um, that whole thing. So, and that happened over here on this side, right where we're staying. That's the land of the Gadarenes. So you're in a biblical zone. Now, let's start over here. This cliff is called the Cliffs of Arbel, and it plays prominently into a lot of different Hebrew history and the Great Revolt in 66 AD. It's not in the Bible, but it was obviously there in Jesus' day. If you go just to the right of it and up that valley, it's called the Valley of the Doves, and you end up at Nazareth. So when Jesus came back and forth to Galilee, he probably came that way many times. As you go just to the right, you see a community right there with the white houses. That's a place called Migdal. Does it sound familiar? Yes. It's named after Magdala. Right down there in that area in front of that, we're going to go there. Uh, those are the ruins of ancient Magdala where Mary Magdalene was from. Follow it around over here and you'll see where the hills start to come into the water. It's, you can see sort of a flat plain there with a lot of green on it. And suddenly there's a little hill there. It looks like there's some structures on it. On top of that hill is the ruins of another city, a town, village, called Gennesaret. That's in the Bible. I'm going to mention that in just a minute. You go a little bit further to the right, and you have the traditional Mount of Beatitudes up there. We're going to actually be up there in a little while, too. Did the, uh, um, uh, did the Sermon on the Mount actually take place on that hill? Who knows? Maybe it did, maybe it didn't. But it's a good enough place, and it's in you know a proper location to, to talk about that. So we're going to go spend some time up there. That's where that big white building is on the side of the hill. Just below it, straight down and to the right, uh, is Capernaum. That's Jesus' center of ministry, his Galilean ministry, right there at Capernaum. And of course, that's where Peter, James, and John had their fishing business, and that's right over there. And then up to the right in the hills over back in that area, not right along the shore, but further up in the hills, was a place called Chorazin. We're going to be visiting Chorazin a little bit later, too, up in that area. And then follow it around to the right, and you can't really see it because the front of the boat is, or the back of the boat, actually, the stern, is blocking our view. But that's where the Jordan River comes into the Sea of Galilee from the north, and it flows out to the south over there. To the right of that is a place called Bethsaida which is where most of the disciples were originally from. And so this is what I wanted to talk about here. Jesus walked on water, this water, this lake. Let me read the story. Let me tie some things together and we're going to bring it around when we get to the synagogue at Capernaum and we're going to complete the story. Over in Matthew chapter 14, verse 22, Matthew records this. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side where he dismissed the crowd. He had been healing people all day, and after that, they were hungry, remember? He's over by Bethsaida. That's way over here. He feeds 5,000, plus their wives and children. So he does the feeding of the 5,000. Man, it's, it's amazing. He's just producing all of this food, 12 baskets full, because there were 12 apostles. They were collecting it also. They were the ones, you know, getting all the scraps. They bring all of that back. I mean, it was incredible. And by the way, when he fed them, don't ignore the details in the Bible. It kind of tells you about their economics back then. It says they all ate and were full. Why would they put that detail in? Because it may be the only time in their lives most of those people ever ate till they were full. Remember, it's a society of limited means back then. They don't have a lot of food. So they all ate until they were full and they're happy. And they want to make Jesus king. This is a huge problem. And it prevailed throughout the Gospels. Even his disciples, until Pentecost, believed that Jesus was going to be the king that threw out the Romans, that was going to take the seat of David, the throne of David in, in Jerusalem, and he was going to rule and reign in a whole new Israelite kingdom. This is what they were hoping for. These were their expectations of him, which is why they could hear him so much, speak so much truth, agree with it, and get it completely wrong. 
because they had these preconceptions of him that he was going to be a ruler with a rod of iron, which means in great authority, and with a sword. And he was neither of those, and he wasn't going to do that. These people thought the same thing. He says these great words. He heals us, and now he feeds us? Look at this. And at the end of the day, when all the bread's been used up so that he couldn't have gone to a bakery and bought it, he had to create the fish. He had to create the bread. They've all eaten, and then they want to make him king. He tells the disciples, hurry, get in the boat and go. And then he dismisses the crowd, and he goes up into the Golan Heights. These are the Golan Heights all along here. He goes up into the hills, and he waits till dark. So here's what happens next. After he had dismissed them, he went up on the mountainside by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. But the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. When there's a drop in barometric pressure, remember, you're three times lower right now than the bottom of Death Valley. This is a really low place on the earth. It's not the lowest place on the earth, but it's very, very low. And when the barometric pressure changes in this area, it sucks air from the coast through that valley and it comes down here and it's blowing this way and it whips this lake up like crazy. It's a very shallow lake so it doesn't take a lot of energy to get it moving. So the boat is coming out of Bethsaida and it's going this way. They're headed over here to Gennesaret. Now the Bible tells us that, not in this particular passage, but it tells us that that's where they're going. So they come out into the lake and they're kind of skirting along the edge of where Jesus had his Galilean ministry and, this, and suddenly the wind is against them and they start getting blown out into the middle of the lake. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them walking on this lake. Let that sink in a little bit. It's not Lake Tahoe, man. We're talking right here, this lake. And when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. They thought it was a ghost. He says, it's a ghost, they said. And they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I. Uh, please note that we say it is I. Transliterated, what he said was, I am. Ah, I like that. Don't be afraid. I am. Don't be afraid. I, boy, tattoo that on the inside of your eyelids, folks. Don't be afraid. I am. Oh, you know what happens next. Peter said, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, come. Now, this boat is really, really bouncing around. I was out here on a boat one day going from Engev, where we got on, to Tiberias over here, which is that big city over there. And as we were heading out, it was really blowing. And the chop was about two feet. It can get up to three to four feet. These guys can tell you how bad it can get. But, but it was not that bad of a day. And this boat was rocking back and forth so much that water was beginning to lap well, over the Can board. you imagine being in a boat one-fourth this size or smaller? They're bobbing around like a cork out there. It's a disaster. They're afraid. They think they're going to drown. They're trying to get this way. They're getting blown back that way. Jesus is coming from that direction on the lake out here. Can you picture it now? He's walking from there along here. They're going this way, and they're getting blown further out into the lake. It's somewhat of a hopeless situation. Peter's completely distracted because he sees Jesus out there. Now, here's the question. How could they see him? It was the middle of the night. It was between three and it was four, three and four in the morning is the best guess when this happened. How could they see him? What time of the year was it? What was happening at that time of the year? Every detail in the Bible is there for a reason. To simplify. Not to complicate, to simplify. It was Passover. Passover always takes place with a full moon. And when these winds come in, you don't have to have clouds. As a matter of fact, frequently you don't. You just get the wind. Jesus comes walking on the lake. They can see him just fine. He's walking under a full moon out on the lake towards these guys. And so Peter got down out of the boat. If the boat's rocking that hard, how'd he do it? Well, you say he's got good sea legs or whatever. You have to be in one of these in a really bad storm to get an idea of just how hard it must have been to get out. I was watching this boat going back and forth and back and forth. And I mean, the water's lapping up. And I'm thinking, how would I get out of this if I wanted to walk? I'm not convinced of this, but I have a theory that Peter crawled before he stood up and walked. Because this thing was going crazy here. It was a much smaller boat for them. And it was probably a much more violent wind. He had to get out of the boat somehow, but it wasn't stepping out of a calm boat onto a calm sea. It was stepping out of a violently tossed boat onto a violent sea. 
And I mean, uh, it's moving quickly. So he probably crawled out of the boat, I'm thinking, I'm just guessing. And he stood up and walked on the water and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Now, Peter can swim. We already know he can because at the end of the Gospel of John, he dives in the lake and he swims. So we know he can swim. It's so violent. They're far out in the lake. He knows he's doomed if Jesus will get him. And of course, we can do the whole sermon on he took his eyes off of Jesus and he sank. And we know the devotion that goes with that. But there's more to it than this. So he cries out to the Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. And then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. they just seen him do miracles, teach great things, feed 5,000 people, plus their wives and children. And now he's walking on water, and he's saying, You're still doubting? Well, they had this preconception of who he was going to be. He was going to be this military messiah. And when they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret, right over there. That's where they wanted to go. And when the men of that place recognized Jesus, they sent word to all the surrounding country, and people brought all their sick to him, begging him to heal the, uh, heal the sick and just touch the edge of his cloak, and all who touched him were healed. So the crowd that was over here that was trying to take him and make him king, now there's a whole other group of people. We heard what happened. News traveled all night. It gets over here. They get off the boat. Immediately, first thing in the morning, he's besieged by crowds of people beginning to come to him. What he ends up doing is works his way along the shore over here to Capernaum, and he goes into the synagogue, and he starts to teach in the synagogue. When we get over there, I'm going to finish this part of the story. But let me give you one last thing here. Peter goes down. Peter doubted. He did take his eyes off of Jesus. But it wasn't like Jesus saying, keep your eyes on me and then you'll stay up. He just said, come on out. And he's watching Jesus. And, and suddenly he realizes, as you know, you've heard the story many times, what am I doing? <laughs> Man, maybe a wave hit him in the face and woke him up. Who knows? But he's, he suddenly starts to sink. And Jesus reaches down Peter cries out, Lord, save me. Jesus reaches down and pulls him up. Do you have to wait for the Lord to save you by crying out first? Because it made me wonder, if Peter had never cried out to the Lord, would Jesus have still saved him? Absolutely. When I look at Peter's life, I'm so glad that there is so much detail about him in the Bible because he's the every man that I think we all are. And if you don't think you are, God is going to expose that at some point. Because Peter could make foolish decisions. Peter, in many cases, you could even say, man, the guy was a loser. Look at what he did. He opened his mouth only to change feet. And here, he takes his eyes off the Lord. He cries out to the Lord, Lord, save me. I find it interesting that in Capernaum, Capernaum, in Caesarea, Peter took that big step that we talked about. Can you imagine what type of a step it was for him to get out of the boat and walk on water? That's a big step. Might have been impulsive, but it was a big step. It might have been desperation, but it was a big step. And he walks out, and he sinks, and Jesus picks him up. Why did you doubt? Shouldn't have doubted, Peter. Have you noticed that Jesus rescues losers? <laughs> Jesus rescues doubters. Jesus rescues people who can't seem to ever get it right. And even the people who don't recognize that it's Jesus at all, he still rescues. Even if they don't give him glory, like these guys worshipped him when he got in the boat. But the truth is that he rescues you. He always has. And he will keep doing that. He rescues losers. Why did you doubt? But hey, he's still walking on water with Jesus when Jesus pulls him up. And that's you too. And I love the lesson from that. Because here you have, I am. Be of good courage, I am. I'm here.
and he rescues losers. Thank God that we have this boat. But even so, he's rescued you and me more times than we know. And someday he'll tell us, and it will just improve our worship in heaven when we hear him tell us how he's done it. So, let's float a little more where Jesus walked, and we'll continue the story when we get to Capernaum. Father, thank you for bringing us out here for the beautiful weather. Look at this, Lord. You've cleared the skies again, we asked. And Lord, you did. Keep blessing Israel. And thank you for blessing us. Make us a blessing to each other and to everybody we're around. And Lord, thank you for rescuing us losers. We can't seem to get it right. And in this life, I know, Lord, that really we never will except your Holy Spirit in us do these great things that you do. And you will still get all the glory and we will worship you. So thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. All right.